Well, they're giving me a nod that it's my turn, so. Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Pastor Steve Bowerly. Um, as I think of who I am in this place today, I'm not real sure, so if you don't know, then I, I guess I don't either. Um, I think most of you know we've ventured into this shared ministry uh, agreement with Zion, where I've been pastor for 30-some years, and now with, with um, St. Paul, we're kind of in this in-between period where we haven't called a pastor here yet, although we did interview a pastor um, a little over a week ago, and actually that person, uh, he's a seminary graduate, Josh, maybe you've heard some of this, but he's actually preaching here July 4th. So just to maybe put that on your radar. Um, but also, I just want to say, I had a brief conversation with Pastor Bliss this past week. He's doing fine. Um, we actually compared some notes, and I'm going to talk about this uh, in a little bit, that, you know, obviously they're getting ready to move or in, in that process, and um, my wife and I are trying to clean out some storage areas and just have all of this stuff. So we were able to kind of compare some of those things, but Pastor Dave's doing great. He did say the day, it was the day that I called him, um, must have been Friday, he said he's going through the Sunday morning jitters. <laughs> and I, I wasn't real clear what he meant by that, and he said, well, don't you get those? And I said, no, I usually get mine about Saturday night or Sunday morning, but he must... He said, oh, yeah, I've gotten jitters for 40 years on Friday. So um, he's still going through that process of, of that. So with that, I would invite you to please stand for our worship this morning. The peace of Christ be with you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It's hard to believe that there's enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your fruit, love to all in need, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to invite the children to please come forward for the children's message. There's a few that are... So is this the chair, Pastor Dave's? I was going to be cool and not sit in that, but I think I'm going to need it, actually. There we go. How's everybody doing today? Do you get nervous coming up for children's sermons? You don't? So do you think I'm nervous? No, you don't think I am for a children's sermon? So you guys have never like made Pastor Dave nervous for children's sermons? Okay, well, that's good news. So I don't know <clears throat> any of your names. So would you want to tell me your names? <laughs> now you're getting a little nervous, okay. <clears throat> so who wants to start? What is your name? Jamathan? Jamathan? Jameson. How are you, Jameson? How old are you? Five. You're five. That's a great age. You know, actually, my daughter, when she was five years old, on her birthday, she turned six, and she started crying at her birthday party when we were getting ready to light the candles. And we said, well, why are you crying? And she said, I just love age five. I don't want to go to age six, but she learned to like age six as well. Okay, so who's next? What is your first name? Morrison? Morris? Okay. How old are you, Morris? Four. Four. That's a great age, too, right? I see some of the kids are starting to move, <laughs> so you're getting a little nervous. Okay, do you want to go back here? How old are you? Or what is your name? Did you say grumpy? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Cade. Cade. Okay. And Cade's four. So we have a five-year-old, four-year-old. And who wants to go next? How old are you? You're three. And what's your name? What, what is it? Liam. Liam. Okay. Liam. So three is a great age also. So who's next? How old are you? How old are you? Five. Another five-year-old. You can't wait for this catechism class. So what is your first name? Calvin. Calvin. Okay. 
Well, hi, Calvin, how are you? And do you want to go next? So what is your name? Audrey. And Audrey, how old are you? Six, okay. And who am I missing? How old are, how old are you? Brindley? And how old are you? How do you know her age? Oh, you're all sisters and brothers, okay? And anyone else? And you're two, and what's your first name? I know Avery already. I did Avery's baptism two years ago. And Avery, you were like about that big at the time? Gotten bigger. So we, we have everyone. There's a couple others back here. So I need a volunteer this morning. Does anybody want to help me? Do you want to help me? Okay, so come on up here. So what I have <clears throat> is a rope. And what do you do? Have you ever played with a rope before? Maybe tied things up, right? So I want you to hold on to that. Only I want you to hold on tighter, a lot tighter. But you need to turn and show them your face as you're turning it. <laughs> a lot tighter, okay? So I want you to imagine that you do not want to let go of this. <laughs> That's a great answer, by the way. Because I'm going to pull it, and I want you to keep it. But you're asking... Why don't I let go of it? Why do you have to hold on to it? So just stick with me for a minute. So can you like hang on to it? You can't, you gotta stand right there. Actually, you gotta move back a little bit. Can you move back down the step? Be careful. You wanna go down one more step? There you go. Both feet, okay. So take a deep breath, hold on tight. You got it? Is, it? is it hard to keep holding on to? Do you, think, do you think I could pull it away from you? Do you think I could pull it out of your hands? I don't know, actually. Maybe if I worked really hard at it. So <clears throat> now you can let go. And think everybody's going to like give you a little applaud for helping. Thanks. But actually, and you... <laughs> You want to hold on to it too, right? She can hold on to it. Let's see what she does. Oh, you let it go. Right, okay. Well, I give you this illustration this morning because sometimes in our lives, we hold on to a lot of things. Can you think of things that you like holding on to? My son, when he was your age, when he was actually, actually about four or five, he was known as a silky baby. Have you ever heard of silky babies? So he would take his blanket, and he wouldn't use a blanket unless it had silk around the edges. You have a blanket, does it have silk on the edge? And he would hold onto that blanket, and he would hold onto that silky, and he would rub it. He'd actually rub blisters into his fingers. But he would not let go of that blanket. And even some of the stuffed animals he had, he wouldn't play with animals unless they had silky tags on the back. So he would not let go of that. But can you think of other things that you don't want to let go of? What is it? Toys. That's exactly right. That's a great answer. Do you think of anything else? My other, my daughter, she would grab a hold of my wife's dress when we were walking places. And there was a while that she got upset. We couldn't figure out why she was upset. It was because my wife was wearing pants and didn't have a, a dress on to hold on to. <clears throat> so I tell you this because, and I'm going to talk about it a little further, 
Sometimes we hold on to things that maybe God does not want us to hold on to. Like maybe bad habits or ways that ways that we treat other people or maybe um, <clears throat> we hold on too long to um, not being nice. You're holding on too? <laughs> you got it? Okay? And so what God says is, I want you to hold on to me and I, I want you to um, hold tight to me and God says, I will never let go. So I can see right now, <clears throat> before we pray, I'm getting some flashbacks of college when we had tug of war. So you think, if all of you want to grab, you want to grab all of you, grab the rope? Do you know what tug of war is? Eat jeepers. Oh, just be careful. I don't want an injury my first Sunday here. No, and I thought there was a couple parents coming. No, parents cannot come up in this. So, okay, well, I'll let you have that. But can we bow our heads in prayer? <clears throat> can we close our eyes and fold our hands? And before I pray, I always just have a little moment of silence. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your children. We thank you for holding on to them and for giving them grace and love and, and, and forgiveness. May these gifts be ingrained in their lives so they may hold closer to you. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming. We'll see you again. Oh, and we have Sunday school, so I think we're going to follow you out to Sunday school. <clears throat>
Let us bow our heads in prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, you are a God of grace and a God of mercy. As we gather together on this day, we know that you are with us. You are with us as we worship. You are with us in our conversations and fellowship. But most of all, you are with us as we go forth into a world in need of Jesus Christ. Help us to be filled with his grace. May your Holy Spirit guide us in our world. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This summer, not only here at St. Paul, but at Zion in, in Waterville, we're going to take some time and look at the book of Acts. And I'm not sure if you know the process of Sunday morning scripture lesson, but in the last year, um, Zion and St. Paul have both used what's called the narrative lectionary. And in all honesty, Pastor Dave and I, on occasion, maybe once a month or so, we would come together and, and talk about the scripture lesson to sort of mentor each other and, and to focus on, on scripture. But in the summer, there is no narrative lectionary, so we can choose whatever we want. So <clears throat> the book of Acts is at a perfect time. There, there are presently more studies and more discussions on the book of Acts than any other time in the history of, in, in my ministry, in the history of my ministry. As churches, we have spent a lot of time looking at how the church is changing. And we've been discussing, and I'm sure you've been part of the conversation, of, of how the church looks so different than the way it used to. We sometimes wonder if the church will even survive, whether it's St. Paul or Zion or the worldwide church. At the beginning of my ministry, <clears throat> I was taught that you advertise something like a worship service or an event <laughs> or a community gathering and and we were taught to advertise it six weeks in advance and it was kind of this marketing strategy and make sure you have three different ways of advertising whether it's word of mouth announcements a bulletin or whatever but we would advertise Worship or an event or community gathering, and then we'd open our doors, and, and people would just fill the churches. Well, that has changed drastically for St. Paul, for Zion, <clears throat> and every church in the world, for that matter. Now, my mother, who I've spent the last couple of weeks with, she, she keeps up on church trends and ideas. She's, she's just gifted in looking at that. And my father was a Lutheran pastor, and, and every time my mom gets into that mode of talking or reading about the church, she'll either talk to me or call me some night late and, and say to me something like, I wonder what your dad would have said about the church today. In all honesty, I think he would have been thrilled. So hold that with me for a moment. The book of the Bible these days that seems to be the most popular is Acts. And the reason being is that it's a model for the church, whether it's in forming a church or whether it's in changing a church. A friend of mine started a congregation some 20 years ago in, in Michigan, and they titled the church Acts 1-8, which is the beginning of the formation of a church. But we're living in this period of time that in the baseball world, we call it a, a tweener. It's, it's when a, 
a fly ball is usually hit beyond a little bit beyond the infield and two or three players usually a couple of infielders and an outfielder come running to the ball from three different directions and it falls in between them it's a tweener now as pastors and churches we're in this in between this tweener period just as the disciples were some 2000 years ago when these words were read from the first chapter of acts they were in between the old Jewish ways that had been around for thousands of years and moving to the new ways of Christianity in between the way is something that's often a tough place to be in it's it's almost like being in two different worlds and as I mentioned earlier as pastors we're not we weren't trained for this it's not easy. It's not easy for churches. I have seen churches, <clears throat> including St. Paul and, and Zion, work hard at getting people into our building. But in all honesty, it's, it's wearing. Because it, it just doesn't seem to be working. God keeps promising us that there's always a new way before us. And here's the key. We can either hate it and fight it and die, or we can love it and embrace it and live in new ways that we never imagined as God continues to give us. Now, years ago, <clears throat> I asked my church leadership a, a simple question. I asked, what are you willing to give in order for your church and yourself to live and to thrive? Now, remember some of the answers. People say, well, I'll, I'll give more money. I'll give more time. I'll give more of my possessions. I'll pray more. So it was a great part of the conversation. But then I asked the question, <clears throat> what are you not willing to change that you know you will die. And I remember one person very clearly, and in all honesty, I think she spoke for a number of other people, but she said, I will not give up my worship style. I will not give up the version of the Bible that I've been reading for all of my life. And in all honesty, it wasn't long after that she died, fighting those changes. But here's a few examples of, of some new things that are out there that when they first came down the, the pike, I, I questioned, are they really working? And one of it is online worship. And I don't know how many views, um, you, you, do you check views after, see how many people are looking? But I, I recall when we first got into COVID, the only hope that I could find within our church in Waterville for the first couple of months, the only hope, because I was standing in front of the sanctuary and my organist was playing the organ. It was the two of us and there were no people and, and we were recording. So that just wasn't the way I was taught. Well, then my technology person said, you know, Pastor, there were 300 people viewing that worship service. And I said, we need to up our game in that. So that's, that's one thing that's changed. And again, I, I struggle with um, the lack of interpersonal connection and, and the community when people aren't gathered together. But if people are getting the word somewhere that they weren't before, I think it's a gift. Or some of you are aware that a Lutheran church in Toledo started a brewery church. 
And unfortunately, it's, it's closed now, but when it was open for, I think, around 10 years, they were holding church in this brewery on a Saturday or a Sunday evening, and, and people were coming from all around that had never received the word before. Or another thing, um, if you like cooking, St. Paul Lutheran Church in Toledo has a cooking church. Their pastor loves to cook. And so uh, once a week, he's in his kitchen, in his home, and he's cooking a meal. He's sharing a recipe. As Lutherans, we all love recipes. But in the midst of him cooking his meal, he's telling a Bible story. And he's talking about Jesus, and he's praying. And, and sometimes you... I've listened to it a couple of times, and I sometimes forget that it's a cooking class because I'm learning about Jesus and, and on and on and on. I could talk a lot. I could talk to you about a tattoo parlor that is, has just taken off where they only do Christian symbols. So, But the good part of where we're at in our lives is that it's not the first time that pastors and churches have been in this place in history. Where not only my mother, but others ask, I wonder what so-and-so would think of the church today. It's not the first time. History shows what we are experiencing right now in the church actually happens every 500 years. There was a book that was written uh, some years ago, and if you want to go to the next slide, um, there we go. This book is titled The Great Emergence. It was a best-selling book. It was written by Phyllis Tickle, and, and the subtitle is How Christianity is Changing and Why. She's an educator, and she studied history trends and, and Christian trends, but here's what she became famous for. She said, every 500 years, the church goes through a huge transformation. And then she goes on to say, it's kind of like a garage sale of sort that takes place, where things <coughs> that need to go <coughs> are thrown out because they're no longer working or, or cluttering the way. My wife and I and Pastor Dave in our conversation, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we're ready to throw away. But history shows this. So Dr. Tickle <clears throat> goes on and shows, and that slide you can't see very well, but she has it outlined <clears throat> every 500 years. And it started with Jesus. That was a huge change. I'm sure many, many people asked the question or, or made the statement, what does your father think about what's happening now when Jesus came along? And in all of these cases, something, as you think of garage sales, something was given up. During Jesus' time, um, it, it was laws. The Old Testament people had hundreds and hundreds of laws, and Jesus came and said, if we're going to continue on as a church, we have, to, we have to let go of laws. So that was in, let's say, the year zero. And then in the year 500, 500 years later, those of you who are historians know that's when Rome fell. And Gregory the Great was the pope at the time, or the bishop, and, <clears throat> and he recorded the largest mission that had ever taken place outside of Rome. They called it the Great Commission, or the Great Mission. And his purpose was to bring people to Christ. And, and what they gave up, they gave up everything that was within Rome and they started going outside. So that was a huge change. People died over that. And then 500 years later, 
In the year 1000, the Great Schism took place. The Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church, they, they split over a disagreement of what was the language we were going to speak in our church. And it ended up, <clears throat> they started speaking in the natural language of people and not in uh, Greek or Latin. Then, 500 years later, Martin Luther comes along and the Reformation and there was lots that were given up. <clears throat> so we're now in the year 2000. And as I think of, as we look 500 years from now, if we look at these titles of Jesus and the Great Commission and the fall of Rome and the Great Schism and Martin Luther, I think ours will be titled COVID. And I, I look at that <clears throat> as something that maybe we're not connecting or realizing now, but as we look at the church, as we look at COVID, we're going to see them coming together. So we're right smack in the middle of this next transformation. This is where our Bible reading comes in today from Acts. Because the disciples were facing exactly the same thing. They were facing a new world. And, and Jesus pretty much was saying, here's what you're facing. So here's what I'm going to give to you. Because Jesus always provides. He's going to give either the book of Acts or Acts 1.8. And Acts 1.8, which was just read a few moments ago, it's, it's actually become the pillar of the church and the church growth. And I just want to read this one section again where the writer Luke says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8 sets the stage for all of Acts. But more important, it sets the stage for us. Stage 1, chapters 1 through 3, he was in Jerusalem. All the disciples were in Jerusalem. Chapter, or the second stage was in chapters 8 through 12, Judea and Samaria. Stage 3, chapters 13 through 28, the ends of the earth. And I think if Jesus was here today, he would be changing that a little bit. Where he would say, you are to be my witnesses in Haskins. You are to be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria or Perrysburg and Perrysburg Township and Bowling Green and to the ends of the earth. This model spread quickly. It, it went when Jesus had risen from the dead, it, it went to Jerusalem and it went to Galilee, the outside region. It went to Nazareth, to Jesus' hometown. James then took it to Spain. John took it to France. Thomas took it to India. And then that word from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, it made its way to the United States to a little town on the east coast of Florida called St. Augustine, where the first church in our country started. And then later, as Lutherans, it went to Hickory, North Carolina, where the first Lutheran church was started. I actually interned there in that town. And then, finally, it made its way to a little town in Ohio in 1881, to a town called Haskins, starting St. Paul. 
But what was a common theme through all this? As the church changed, as the church boomed, something was always given up. Something was always let hold of or let a hold of. In, in Rome, it was the language was changed. In the Reformation, they, they gave up indulgences. COVID, yet to be determined. But in a sense, like Phyllis Tickle said in her book, a garage sale needs to take place. So here's the question. What are we holding on to in our lives and in our church, for that matter, that's not valuable? What do we need to give up that's not valuable? At my church, we've done this exercise over the years. It's called Stop Start. If one of my staff members comes and um, has a new idea, I'm like, that's great, let's look at that, but what do we need to stop? Because we just can't continue on adding and adding. When we first started doing it, it was difficult, but actually it's been a fun exercise over the years. So the question is, what do you need to give up? What are you holding on to in your life that's serving no purpose or what are you guarding it was interesting as I pulled in the church this morning your front sign does anybody know what your sign says who puts the words on your greeting sign somebody's pointing but it said don't look back we're not going that way so what are you holding on to? Is it, is it fear of change? Sometimes the fear of thinking about changing is worse than changing itself. Or maybe you're holding on to guilt. Or maybe you're holding on to habits. Or maybe you're holding on to people. Or your past. Maybe you're holding on to the attitude that you're thinking that you're in this on your own, this thing that we call life. Well, our soul, it often gets filled with clutter. And it needs a garage sale to, to open us up to Jesus and his ways and his grace and his love. Now, let me just finish by reading these words from Psalm 55. And it's, it's verse 1, or verse, it's verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord. Cast what you're holding on to. And he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. We've all heard the phrase, let go, let God how simple, how true, and yet at times how difficult. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we, we often keep a hold of things in our lives that come our way. <clears throat> things like fear and guilt and habits and, and sometimes even people. We often hold on to thinking that we're in this journey of life by ourselves. But you have given us people to help us walk this path. You have given us your son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross and rose from the dead. May we let go. May we cast all of our burdens and, and all of our struggles on you, and you will sustain us. In your name we pray, amen. I would invite you to please stand. <clears throat> and let us profess our faith 
with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy God, you plant the seeds of faith in every nation. Enliven your church so that the good news of your grace may root and grow throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creator, even the trees, shrubs, and flowers delight in your goodness. From the depths of the soil to the highest mountain, bring forth new plants. Restore growth to places suffering drought. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Judge of nations, we pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility, dedicating their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine Comforter, you show compassion to those in need and provide relief to those who call on you. Bless all who suffer, especially people trapped in cycles of poverty and homelessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, this house of worship belongs to you. We give thanks and we pray for our church musicians. We dedicate to you the joyful noise that comes from this place, the cries of children, the melody of voice and instruments, and the songs from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give thanks for our ancestors in the faith who are now at home with you. We look forward to that day when we are reunited in your new creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. This time we'll receive our offering. set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, 
Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered now into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come to the table. The body of Christ is given for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Please now take the cup of grape juice and water and wafer out of the package and partake. May this holy and precious body and blood of Jesus Christ <laughs> strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let's stand together, please, and pray. Jesus, bread of life, have we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Let us sing verses 1 through 3 and 5 of our sending hymn, all verses except number 4. are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.